Father's Day. I'm going to do, do a Father's Day sermon. I don't always do, uh, uh, I don't always go topical on the Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, and other types of days that would lend themselves to topical sermons. Sometimes we just keep going through the book of John or, or whatever book we're preaching through. That's the only book we've ever preached through, so that's the best example. Uh, but the passage in John today talked about how God the Father uh, in judgment hardens the hearts of Israel. And I thought, well, <laughs> I don't think that would be what I would want to preach on today. So, <laughs> so I, I, went, I went fairly topical um, to talk about uh, Father's Day, uh, this day that we uh, have the opportunity to honor the great men who have given us life. And it really is, uh, like Mother's Day, it's a day of a lot of mixed emotions uh, for people for lots of different reasons. Uh, this is, 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 there's a complexity with this. I don't feel like it's quite as complex as Mother's Day feels to me. But uh, Father's Day, uh, there is, there's a complexity because there are a lot of issues, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of baggage that comes up on Father's Day. And w- one of the, one of the uh, things that is, is, makes it challenging is the, is the oughtness of Father's Day, uh, the, the supposed to ness of Father's Day, as in we ought to honor these men. We really ought to. And, and, and they ought to be, we ought to be the kind of men that are honorable. And the truth is that each in, our, in each of our lives, there's failures on both sides. We don't always honor these men the way that we ought to honor them, and these men, including ourselves, those of us who are fathers, we, we aren't always the men that we are supposed to be. And that makes it challenging to deal with the topic of fatherhood, uh, and it's this last point uh, uh, that I really want to focus on today. Uh, what's, a, what's a father supposed to be? What ought a father B. That's where I want to park today. Actually, I want to, I want to broaden it a little more than that. I want, to, I want to just generalize and say, what ought a man be? What's a man supposed to be? Which means that this is particularly relevant to the men in the room. Uh, so I'm going to kind of, every once in a while, kind of zero in on one smaller portion of our body and kind of give that some attention. But I think it's really relevant to everybody in the room because I think we all ought to know what God intends a man to be. I certainly want my daughters to know what a man ought to be. I want every one of us to have some sense for the design that God has for biblical Manhood, and I think that there is widespread confusion on the topic. I, I, I think that there that, that, that there is not a, a good understanding of what a man is supposed to be, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Let me give you a few of them. One reason that there is a kind of a widespread misunderstanding or confusion about what a man ought to be is because there's a general brokenness in humanity. It's as old as time. Man overboard. Sorry about that. <laughs> it said, it says, oh, there's a confusion that's built into the very nature of humanity because of sin. Men and women are broken. We are personally broken. There's a personal brokenness. There is a relational brokenness in men and women. We are broken in our awareness of who God is. We are broken in our awareness of who we are. We are broken in our awareness of of others. And because of that brokenness, it leaves us with this tendency towards confusion about our identity. And that that impacts issues of manhood and womanhood and sexuality and gender identity issues that we all have because of the brokenness of of the world. And as a result, the world is marked with a malfunction in the way that men and women think about each other. It is. God actually determined that that would be so as a matter of curse, as a matter of judgment. 
Genesis 3.16, God says there's a, there's a consequence of the introduction of sin into the world that is going to infect the world. There's a curse on the world that has to do with how men and women relate to one another. Genesis 3.16, ladies, your desire, wives, shall be for your husband. And he shall rule over you. Curse. Your desire shall be for your husband. Not meaning you are going to love this guy. <laughs> meaning you want his role. And in response, he will dominate you. And world history plays it out. We've seen it over and over and over again. The reality of the curse that is infecting the dynamics of the relationship between a husband and a wife. And the world is replete with the fallout of that curse. Men and women misunderstanding the roles and responsibilities that God has given to them. There is a natural tendency because of sin to have confusion about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, for that matter. That's one reason why there's confusion. Here's a second reason why there's confusion over this issue. It is because of the unique state of the disorder regarding masculinity and femininity in our time, in our world, in our culture. There's a, we are in a unique phase of cultural shift in the West, but really in the world, there's a unique phase of cultural shift with regards to these issues. We live in a time that has responded to the historical abuses of men. And we're just going to be honest about that. Men have not treated women well historically. It's part of the curse. And we are living in a time where our culture is, has, has responded to those historical abuses by men of women. And that, that response is a social experiment that has swung the pendulum to the other extreme or to another extreme that is desperately attempting to obliterate and altogether redefine all formal notions of gender and sexuality, like a bad tattoo. We are trying to rid ourselves of, redefine, reassign gender and sexuality from the ground up. That's the time that we live in. And that new identity, that new way of looking at things is not looking to the Bible as the compass for the redefinition. Right? In fact, we are inventing our own confused meanings as a society, inventing our own confused meanings of gender and sexuality, and built into those definitions, these new definitions, is an intentional rejection of anything that even smells like what the Bible would teach on these. It's intentional especially in the West, which was built on a Judeo-Christian ethic. We are done with that. So not only is there a natural tendency to be confused about this, but on top of that, we live in a society that is amplifying the confusion by proclaiming a new narrative, a self determined a human derived narrative about manhood and womanhood that is running in a dead sprint away from Jesus and from his word. In my early 20s I experienced a lot of personal confusion uh, with regards to this issue. I had experienced enough turmoil and heartbreak in relationships that were absolute disasters that I started just asking a lot of questions about what does it mean to be a man? Because obviously I am totally confused about this. Uh, and I'm totally confused about women too. Uh, I, I, got, I, I, I would like everybody else, I'm just kind of, I, I'm just shooting in the dark. I don't know. I don't know. I, I got no compass. I don't know how to think about these things. 
I'm just taking my best guess to try to figure out how the world turns and how I'm supposed to relate to this beautiful creature. And God brought two people into my life that changed me forever. Uh, a woman by the name of Debbie Reeves, who was the mother of a close friend, and Justin Evans. And both of them said, you need to read Elizabeth Elliot. And so I picked up Elizabeth Elliot's The Mark of a Man and Let Me Be a Woman. <laughs> <laughs> And for the first time in my life, I realized that manhood and womanhood are not arbitrary social constructs. God made them male and female, and there is a design. God has a design for manhood and womanhood. God has a design for what I'm supposed to be. The fact that I am male means that there is a design for my life, and, 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 and the Bible is not silent on that. And, and like a jigsaw puzzle that just gravitated into Closure. I, my soul just clicked into place. And I thought, oh my gosh. There's design. It just made so much sense of my, of my life and the things that were like a, really jacked up because of my failure to know what, 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 what God's compass had to say about this. I had a new center of gravity. And because of that, I started to evaluate um, my life and the life of other men according to what I was discovering in God's Word, and I came to this conclusion. There is an alarming uh, lack of great men in the world. There is an alarming shortage of truly great men in the world, and and. Perhaps especially in our generation, that's true. Um, maybe it's always been a problem. I suspect it's always been a problem to some extent. We're tasting it maybe in a, in a kind of a unique way right now. But I, I just want to say that's not the design. Men are not created to be detrimental to the world. They are not meant to be passive. Men are not meant to be cowardly. Nor are they meant to be domineering. Nor are they meant to be cruel. That is not what men are made to be. Men are not made to be deadbeats, emotionally distant, dropouts, dealers, quitters, gangsters, cheaters, pimps, pirates. A boat full of pirates. That is not what men are made to be. Pimps, abusers. Men are created to bear the image of God in the world by providing a portrait of what God is like by means of biblically defined, masculine, honorable, humble, servant-hearted, sacrificial leadership in the home, in the church, and in society. That's God's design. And it is radically, profoundly controversial and offensive, perhaps even to some people in, in this room this morning. But I believe that it is, un, it is undeniably biblical. From the beginning, before the curse, the Maker determined that God's men are created to take a general disposition of leading the way. It's their calling to sacrificially and honorably spearhead the mission. It is their job to model godliness. It is their job to take the first bullet. It is our job to set and uphold the standard for the home and for the church and for society through lives of true Christ-like leadership in order to provide the world with a distinctly masculine picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when men are fulfilling this calling to true biblical manhood, the proverb will prove true. The glory of children is their fathers. Not because mom doesn't count. There are lots of other proverbs that talk about the honor that a mother brings to the home. We talk about that on Mother's Day. Today, this, this, this proverb talks about dads. The glory of children is their fathers. Proverbs 17, 6. Flip it around. Fathers are the glory of their children. The word glory here has the connotation of honor. And the picture is that of a child with a crown on his head. And that crown is dad. And that dad provides a dignified identity to his children because dad is an admirable, honorable man. The glory of children is their daddies, their fathers. Because dad is an admirable and honorable man. And there's something about this that I think resonates within the heart of a man, perhaps even uniquely. I want to be a truly great man. I want my life to be respectable such that it imparts an identity, a respectable identity to my children. Men, don't you want to be known as truly great men of God? That your children would be distinguished because of the blessed privilege of growing up in your home. Don't you want that? You aspire to be the heroic kind of man to, to whom honor is given like the great men of our faith. Think of Joshua and Caleb. Ten spies plus Joshua and Caleb. Twelve spies total. They go into the promised land before Israel goes in there. And they're right on the verge. This is Numbers 13, I think. They're right on the verge of the promised land. Ten guys go in to check it out to make sure that like, it is truly a land flowing with milk and honey. They come back. They've got all this fruit. They're like, oh my goodness. It is a glorious place. And ten of the spies say, we will never be able to take it. The people in there are giants. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And Joshua and Caleb are like, the Lord is with us. Let's go. Let's do it. Don't you want to be like Joshua and Caleb? Ah, two guys. Out of ten, two guys were men of faith. I'm going to be one of them. Don't you want to be one of them? I want you to be one of them. Most men won't be. Most Ten out of twelve. Or David, minus the adultery. Or Saul, the apostle Paul or Luther, or Charles Spurgeon, or maybe your own dad. Want to be like him? You ever heard Jason Miller talk about his dad? Who in here has heard Jason talk about his dad? Brad Miller must be a tremendous man of God. He's not a perfect man. Brad wouldn't claim to be perfect. Jason wouldn't say that he's perfect. But the way Jason talks about his dad, Jason wants to be like his dad. Don't you want to be a mighty man of the faith also? Wouldn't you like to be the kind of man of whom it is, is said? You ever heard this child talk about him? heard his child talk about him? That man's a hero in the sight of his kids. That the desire for that is not an accident. You are made to want to be that kind of man because you're made to be 
that kind of man. The glory of children is their fathers. And as we talk about that greatness, I know that in the heart there is something else that's taking place. Because alongside the desire to be a respectable man of God, the concern lies there that what if my life isn't that respectable or won't be that respectable? I'm feeling that, right? I ought to be that kind of man. And perhaps I'm not. Perhaps I haven't been. And the question that I face as, as, as we look at the passage this morning is how can I inspire the men in our body to run, to run for it? Let's run for it. How do, we, how do we inspire one another to pursue this calling when you've got the tension of I want to be that and I'm afraid it might not be that or might not ever be that? So I've got three points I want to make. The first one, I want to deal with this fear a little bit. This fear that, that I haven't been, I won't be, I can't be, I've never been, I don't know what it would look like, it's too late. I want to deal with that one for Here's my first point this morning. Men, we have all failed to be what we ought to be. We have all failed to be the men that we ought to be. Let's just start there. We gotta, well, let's just be honest with that. We have to... We have to admit that that's the case. Everybody in this room feels it. And I'm not saying that because that's the pastor thing to say. I'm saying it because I have a deep sense of the, this awareness that I have a deep sense of remorse over the ways that I have failed to be the man that I ought to be. I have failed with my words. I have failed with the management of my home. I have failed with my parenting. I have failed with my pastoring. I have failed with my temper. I have failed in my jobs. I have failed with the purity of my mind and the purity of my actions. I have failed with the faithfulness to my word. I have failed with the intentions of my heart in countless ways. I have failed to be the Christ-like leader that I'm called to be in my home, in the church, in society. There's not a man in here who's been who's been the man that he ought to have been. There's not. And we, we, we have to start there. We need to know this about ourselves. We need to be honest with God about it. We need to be honest with ourselves about it. We need to be honest with our wives about it. We need to be honest with our friends about it. We've all failed. We've all failed because we're infected with with the disease that we inherited from our father and, and he inherited it from his father and he inherited it from his father. All the way back to our great-grandfather Adam. He was supposed to lead the way for our race to sacrificially and honorably spearhead the mission to model godliness, to take the first bullet. Adam, take the first bullet for her. To set the standard for the home and the church and in society. And instead, Adam failed to provide the masculine leadership that his family needed in a moment of crisis. And we, his children, we've been paying for that failure ever since. Eve was under attack. Eve was under very uh, clear satanic attack in Eden. She's listening to, she's buying the lies of the enemy. She's setting her feet on this path to destruction. And dad is right there with her, according to Genesis 3.6. He's standing right there. And what happens in the moment of crisis you know what happens? Role reversal. Eve takes leadership in the situation. She gives Adam the fruit. It's been explicitly forbidden by God. 
which was a failure on Eve's part. But you know where the scripture ultimately lays the blame in the situation? According to Romans 5.12, through one man, sin entered the world. It's Adam. When God comes to the garden after the, uh, the bites have been taken, the man and the woman heard the sound of the Lord coming in the garden, and they hid from him, and the Lord God said to the man, Adam, where are you? This was a they, this was a they thing all, the, all along, but it's, it's the man who is held responsible. It's the man who is the representative of humanity. It's the man through whom sin enters the world. Why? He's the leader. He's been given the assignment of leadership. Uh, you guys ever seen A Bug's Life? Um, who, who's, the guy, who's the guy who creates all the... Inv- Flick? He's the guy who creates all the inventions. He creates this, like, grain-gathering machine. And, and they're, the, the, you know, these poor ants, they're under the tyranny of, of the grasshopper. The king of the grasshopper's name is Hopper. And Hopper comes every year to get a sacrifice from the ants. So the ants got to gather all this grain, and they got to put it up on this leaf. And, they, and then Hopper comes, and he takes all the food. He's a total tyrant, right? And, 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 and Flick, he's got this great idea. He's got this, I've got this grain built, this grain gathering machine, Flick flick, gathers all this grain, and he ends up knocking all of the grain that has been built up for the sacrifice for Hopper, he knocks it all in the water, ruins everything. Well, it happens to be the new queen's first day on the job, and Hopper shows up, and he's like, where's the sacrifice? And the queen is like, well, we had it right here, and then Flick was, Flick had this new machine, and Hopper goes, princess? First lesson in leadership, everything is your fault. You see, Eve made a mistake here. Adam failed in his duty. It was his job to lead. And rather than rejecting the fruit, and rather than providing protection and some guidance for Eve, like stop talking to that thing. It's an animal. It's not supposed to talk. And it's telling you to disobey him. Rather than loving God, rather than loving his wife by destroying the anti-God serpent. That's what Adam should have... He should have killed that thing. Rather than doing that, Adam is passive and he comes under leaves, leaves, Eve's leadership and then puts on leaves. <laughs> and he rebels against God, and he eats. He's unfaithful to his duty. He's unfaithful to his God. He's unfaithful to his wife. And we have suffered from it ever since. And the entry of sin comes into the world. And you know what, you know what it comes in through? A failure of masculine, of masculine leadership. Adam failed as a husband... And he failed as a father to be the man that God created him to be. He's supposed to lead us, and instead he produces the first and the most significant failure of manhood in history. And we have all, all of us men, we've all followed in his footsteps. (laughs) Got the same DNA running through our veins. And you're thinking right now, okay, I do not feel inspired (laughs) toward manhood by this. Yeah. Okay, not yet, but I, 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 want, I want us to understand that we, get, we have to come to terms with this reality in our own lives, men. We have to come to terms with this. Because until you do, you'll never be a great man, because truly great men have to recognize that they are broken men in need of grace. Truly great men have to recognize that they are broken men in need of grace. You can't be a great man until you realize that you don't have in yourself what it takes to be a great man. You need grace from God to empower you to be who God made you to be. 
And if you can't receive grace from God, you're proud. If you think that in yourself you've got what it takes to be a great man, you're proud. And you just don't know yourself well enough yet. (laughs) God opposes the proud. You know who he gives grace to? The humble. The man that knows he's weak. You'll never be a great man unless you can be a humble man and know your weakness and be honest about the fact that I failed as a man. That we've got to start there. How many men are emasculated in their ability to become great men because of their unwillingness to admit that they are weak men and they need help from God? Know yourself. We've all failed to be the men that we ought to be. Here's the second point. Jesus is the Savior of men who have failed. you got to know this too. Jesus is the Savior of men who have failed to be what they ought to be. Knowing yourself as a man in need of grace is the crucial first step toward being a great man. But you can't just stop there. You can't spend your whole life just meditating on your failures as a man. You have to lift your eyes up to the cross and consider and believe in the gracious love of Christ. You have to be not only a man who is humble and recognizes his sin, you have to be a man who has faith in the one who rescues from sin. You've got to be a man of faith. Sometimes we have a hard time getting to that place of admitting that we're failures, right? We have just a hard time of admitting that we're wrong. We have a hard time admitting, we have a hard time getting humble. And sometimes, once we've come to terms with those failures, we have a hard time of then disciplining ourselves to believe that God has actually removed the guilt and He actually wants to and can change you. Did you really be- Do you believe that? Do you believe God can change you? You need to believe that Christ has taken the guilt, given you the Spirit, And he can change you. Some of you right now might be thinking, okay, you're right. I have failed. I failed as a leader. I got no devotional life. I don't lead my wife in devotionals. I don't lead my kids in devotionals. I I don't even have devotionals for myself. I don't pray. I'm not a praying man. If my wife or my kids want to do something that's not best, I have no backbone. I'm just like Adam. You're right. I'm just like Adam. My kids don't respect me. My wife doesn't respect respect me. I hear you talking about being a great man of God. I want it, and I don't have it in me. Good. Now, take your eyes off yourself and set them up on Jesus. Set your eyes on recognize the reality of your situation, be honest, be humble, be broken, and now set your eyes on Jesus, the great Savior of men who have failed to be what they ought to be. He forgives you. He would love to help you. You not only need grace, there is grace. There is grace available for men. He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. That's you, dude. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So abide. You recognize your failure? Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. So abide in him and watch him produce fruit through you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful faithful, he will surely do it. Jesus can change you. 
We've all failed to be the men that we ought to be. Jesus is the Savior of men who have failed. Your guilt has been nailed to the cross. The Spirit has been given to you. So receive His grace. Stand back up. Wherever you are as a man, wherever you failed, you need to stand back up. And now you need to follow Jesus. He's given you grace. Stand back up. Start again. Follow Jesus. Like I said, the Bible doesn't leave us in the dark about a man, what a man is supposed to be. There's actually a very specific design and there is a very clear model so that we can see it in action and imitate it. Which brings me to the third point that I want to make. Jesus is the model of truly great manhood. Jesus is the model of truly great manhood. And the clearest place to see Biblical masculine manhood at work is in the death of Jesus for his bride. Um, my favorite passage for this is, is uh, Ephesians 5. Go ahead and turn there if you're not there already. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. It's a passage about marriage. And it compares the relationship between Jesus and his church to the relationship between a husband and a wife. And if you're single, I don't want you to check out right here. Uh, the, the, the broad concepts of masculinity and femininity in the Bible are intended for every man and for every woman, regardless of your marriage status. And one of the best places to see masculinity and femininity is to look at the instructions for the differing roles and responsibilities for men and women when they come into a marriage relationship. So, this is relevant for all of us. Let's look at the model of manhood in the life of Jesus. I'm going to start reading in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's how you love her. He loved the church. He died for the church. That's how you love her. That, she, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus did not use his leadership over the church to domineer and intimidate her. His authority didn't produce oppression he didn't take advantage of her. He didn't rule her with an iron fist or make petty demands for the sake of improving his own kind of selfish comforts. He didn't whip us into shape and use his power and use his authority to enslave us to a life of lesser joys and relinquished privileges. Uh, Jesus saw his leadership of the church as a call to make sure that she is cared for. Jesus' leadership of his bride was executed with a love that was so powerful and so bold and so relentless that he was unwilling to allow her to perish even if it cost him his own life. I'm not going to let it happen. You're my bride. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Adam, Adam was, was trying to preserve self. You put leadership into the hands of a man who is wanting to preserve self, it's a very dangerous thing because you just became his tool for his own self-preservation. Adam wanted to enjoy the comforts of a non-confrontational relationship. I'm going to say that again. Adam wanted to enjoy the comforts of no confrontation with Eve. Unwilling to confront the enemy in order to protect her. Unwilling to confront her when she's doing something that is not good for her or anybody else. She was deceived. She's in danger. He's unwilling to endure discomfort 
put himself in the path of danger in order to love and to serve those who are entrusted into his care. He's unwilling to obey what God has commanded him to do in the face of temptation. I'm sure the temptation was very, very strong even for Adam. Adam was unwilling to carry out the weight of the responsibility to lovingly lead. He failed there. That's where he failed. And where Adam failed, and where all men have failed, Jesus has succeeded. Because Jesus wasn't living to preserve life here and now. You put leadership into the hands of a man who's not living for himself here and now, but living for the praise of God, put leadership into that guy's hands, you're in good hands. He's not living to preserve himself. He's living for the glory of God, and that's the best thing for everybody. Jesus was willing to confront the enemy of God. That's the kind of man ought to be leading. He's willing to confront his dear bride when she's in danger. He's willing to endure discomfort and stand in the way of danger for the sake of his bride. He's willing to endure the shame of being hated by her. Who killed Jesus? His bride killed him. That's okay. I'll do it anyways. I'll do it to save her. Because I'm not living to preserve my life. I'm living for her good. Whatever it takes. The glory of God and the good of people. Jesus was the supreme, self-sacrificing servant leader. And we were saved by Jesus in an unparalleled act of masculine leadership. He was a truly great man because in the kingdom of God, greatness is marked by service. Whoever would be great among you, I've used that word very carefully today, and I'm, and I make no, I'm not ashamed to say, man, you are called to be great men. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Great men are servants. And you're made for it. To show the world what Jesus is like. That's the picture of manhood that we should have in our minds. Men are not called to be passive. And they're not called to be tyrants. We're called to be leaders who die for those entrusted into our care. And if we're going to do that well, we have to know ourselves to be men who have failed to be the men we ought to be. we got to be humble. Secondly, we have to know that Jesus is the Savior of men who have failed. we got to be humble. we got to be men of faith. Thirdly, we must look to Jesus as the model of truly great manhood. We have to be obedient servants. We have to be men who are humble. We have to be men of faith. And we have to be obedient servants of Christ. That's a great man. That's the kind of man I want to be. It's the kind of man I want you to be. It's the kind of men we are called to be. Humble, faith-filled, servant men, obedient to Christ. And when that kind of man is in the home, fathers are the glory of their children. And so, brothers, in the words of the Apostle Paul, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let's pray.